very early on, my parents told me the value of an education. And the education was the ticket to success. We didn't have a lot of money. And during the years of childhood, we were obviously doing better, and I was experiencing that. But, I mean, you have to consider that I was first generation here. I'm the first one to, to go to graduate school, let alone college. I studied very hard. I was very studious growing up, and I went to uh, a very good uh, university, and, and that's when I really became introduced to the world of finance. I remember I was in school, and they told me in class that, you know, there are certain things that you need to do to get from an intern or an analyst to become like a managing director or a partner. And part of that process was, of course, going to the best schools and and studying hard and getting good grades, but also getting good internships and working for good companies, going to business school, and then moving up the ladder. I remember it was like 15 years ago, and um, I wrote all this down, and I was like, this is exactly what I'm going to do. And I did. And so uh, over the years, you know, I ended up graduating undergrad. I took a job in Chicago. I spent several years out there. I was completely immersed in the markets. And then I made my way over to the West Coast in LA. I was moving up the ranks, I was getting promoted, I was working hard, I was networking, I was doing everything that they told me to do. I'm fully immersed in the world of finance. I was living, breathing, it It was a big part of my identity. And uh, they said, okay, well, you know, to go to the next level, to be even more successful, you need to go to business school. You need to go to good business school, you need to do well, and that's what I did. I went to business school, and after business school, I got a really good job, and within a couple years, I was a director, I was sitting on an investment committee, I was managing billions of dollars. I mean, this is exactly where I wanted to be. And as I continued to progress, I literally landed my dream job. This was a part of one of the books I read when I was in college before I even knew I wanted to go into finance. I ended up working with these people at a hedge fund and it was, it was literally my dream come true. Every couple of years as I'm getting promoted and, and doing all these great things, my salary, my income is going up. And so by the time I was 30, I bought a home in uh, Newport Beach. Within a couple of years, I had then uh, gotten a high rise in downtown LA. And so now I have two places, right? I have one by the beach, I have one in the city. I had multiple cars. But what started happening was as I'm becoming more successful and doing better, I just realized that I'm not becoming happier. I'm accumulating more things I have more awards and more plaques, more titles and a lot more responsibility. There was this growing feelings of just unfulfillment. And it wasn't that I was sad, I wasn't depressed, but it was a very deep, guttural, unhappy feeling. And it was coming from inside. And this was a sensation that I've, I've never experienced before. And it was growing. I was just thinking, this can't be it. This can't be what they told me it was going to be. I mean, there's got to be more. I felt like I was a robot. I would get up, uh, go to work. I'd work, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 hours. Uh, I'd come back, eat, go to sleep so I could do it all over again. And at first I was working to live, but then uh, at the end I was just uh, living to work. And I wasn't really experiencing anything. Something was missing. I remember I was like, I want to buy my first home, I bought my first home. And then I'm like, okay, uh, I'm happy, but I'll be really happy if I have like a really good relationship with a girl, right? Then I'll be really happy, right? And then, okay, then now I'm in a relationship with someone I care about. I'm like, okay, I'm happy, but you know what? I'll be a little bit more happy if I can go, we can go vacation here. Th then I'll be really happy. And then like, we keep going up how we're trying to one-up ourselves. But the thing is that it's desire and it's, it's never ending. It will never end. And that, that's kind of the realization I came to 15 years into my career. And I looked back and I said, I did all the things that I was supposed to do and I'm still not happy. Everyone told me that I would be successful, but what they really were trying to tell me is that, hey, this is, this is gonna get you closer to happiness, which was in fact the farthest thing from it. I was going backwards. The more I grew professionally and, and the more things I acquired, I felt like the more empty I was becoming. And um, I had been practicing you know, mindfulness and, and, and movement. And so I really started to ratchet that up and I started doing more. 
And uh, it wasn't until I started meditating daily, consistently for a period of time that I noticed that the shift started occurring. And so the thing that really pushed me forward was it was like a Friday afternoon and uh, the partners of the fund, they had brought their kids. And I remember there was this one kid. He just looked like the sweetest kid. And I'm talking with the kid and getting to know him and we're joking around. And I just started listening to his story, his story of his life, of kind of some things that were going on at home and that were part of his day to day. And I left that conversation and I remember thinking, I was like, oh my God, this kid is being traumatized by our world, the world that we live in. And that was really the focal point for me. It, it, and I just woke up. I just realized what I was doing to myself, pushing myself so hard and I was constantly pushing, pushing, pushing for a better future. Getting to where I am right now was, was not an easy process. When I left my career, it, it was almost as if I had lost my identity. What's my purpose? Who am I? Why am I here? I sold all my things, got rid of all my possessions, and I just began meditating. And I really quieted my mind, and that's when the ideas and the inspiration, it kind of came to me. And I just really liberated myself from this immense type of suffering. And I said, you know, how great would it be to actually have a job or a career where that it's not so much about me making it, but what if I could help other people make it through their own suffering, through their challenges? That's when I got involved with the program of mindfulness and mindfulness facilitation. And next thing you know, I'm at the UCLA School of Neuroscience. I'm studying this practice in a very higher education type of environment very technical where uh, a lot of our teachers, our professors, and our speakers are they're neuroscientists, they're doctors, psychiatrists, uh, they're all PhDs, and they've been practicing mindfulness and meditation for decades. We live in this, in this era of consumerism and materialism. And so when having other responsibilities, family responsibilities on top of all these, all these other items that you're still paying for and debt, I mean, debt levels are, are extremely high. You're in this, this vicious cycle. It's this never ending loop. So if you turn on the TV, you open up a magazine, it's always an ad. And nowadays with social media, these are targeted ads. So they already know they already know how much you make. They already know your preferences. You have to continue to work for the sake of paying for those things that you've already consumed. And then you, and then you have a family, you have uh, kids, and you have a, you know, a partner, and you have a mortgage, and, and you have these trips that you, have to, that you took and that, on your credit card and you gotta pay for. And then on top of that, you're still watching these commercials. And so what is that breeding? First, that's breeding a lot of stress. This level of stress, in my opinion, is unprecedented. I don't think we've ever experienced this type of stress before. We have stress being caused by the foods that we eat and the chemicals that we're putting into our body. And then we have the stress that is coming into our minds. I mean, if you turn on the TV, if you see that there are wars being fought in countries all across the world, and we're involved in a lot of these things, and, and just watching these things on television or hearing about these things has an impact. It increases your stress and your cortisol and all these, these chemicals that adversely impact your body. And at the end of the day, what is this doing? I mean, this is a breeding ground for mental health issues. And I think the level of mental health or the lack of mental health awareness is unprecedented. Look at all the celebrities who have died. I mean, we got Michael Jackson, we have you know, Robin Williams, and you have a lot of these very famous actors who were arguably at their peak for a very long time, and they had vast amounts of material wealth. But that just goes to show that the wealth and the money doesn't really solve the need to have meaning and to have a purpose. I think that's what's lacking, and that's why right now you're seeing 
just this unprecedented amount of mental health issues. I mean, anxiety, we have depression, we have all these illnesses. It's almost as if it's, they're becoming normal. It's common. And, and people talk about it at dinner. They talk about like, oh, you know, I had to go see my shrink or my doctor has got me on this new medication. And, and literally, these are things that people talk about now in social settings. And it's a little scary. There's this constant desire to either be someone else, be somewhere else, or this desire that I want to feel better than I feel right now. And so we're looking for, really, it's these little short-term little doses of like dopamine, these chemicals that make us feel really good. And sometimes these chemicals are internal, sometimes it could be like sugar or drugs, caffeine, tobacco. And this is happening across, not only on a personal level, but you're starting to see it, like for example, even in the financial markets. People are looking for short-term trades. I want to make short-term profits. And it's really starting to shift society. You think about these large public companies like Apple, who do they answer to? They answer to the investors, the people who own the shares. And what do the investors want? They want immediate short-term profits. They want that instant gratification. I want those instant returns. And so that's why there's so much emphasis on quarterly earnings, right? But one quarter is only three months. That's not even, uh, it's minuscule part of the life cycle of let's say a product. And so you're seeing corporations are actually having to give in to be able to generate short-term returns for their investors. And, and it's, it's becoming an issue. You're starting to see it. What worked for me was really this practice of, of mindfulness. Because with this practice, you, you realize that there is power in presence. I think the most powerful tool that we have is the power of intention. Because if you think about, you know, the world that we live in is this quantum world of where everything is energy. And that energy is transferred through your intention. So if you ask someone, you know, and I always ask people that I work with, where do you see yourself in three years, four years, five years? And if they say, well, I'm not sure, guess what? You're already there. So in order to be able to, to create that movement, you have to have an intention. Otherwise, you're already there. You're not moving. I would say the majority of the population feels like they're not good enough or that, or that, that they're not worthy or that, that they don't belong. This is just the way that we've been programmed. Our potential is infinite, but it's we get in front of ourselves. We're our own biggest obstacle. We create these obstacles that, that keep us from doing all these great things. And that's a very easy thing to believe and, and tell yourself because it takes a lot of effort, uh, focus, and concentration to, to get to where you want to be, right? And so there's that self-doubt that, that always creeps in in that little voice that says that you're not good enough. Or maybe this isn't for you. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy. If you tell yourself enough times that you're not good enough, then guess what? You will begin acting and behaving as if you're not good enough. And I think, you know, it's really important to realize that there is someone or something, and it's called your subconscious, is taking notes, is recording everything that you are saying to yourself. And a lot of this stuff manifests. So you have to be really careful what you are telling yourself because someone is back there recording the conversation, your inner conversation. The mind is a wandering mind, right? We, we've, we've been programmed this way. And so the mind is constantly searching for, for problems to solve and danger. Your mind will ruminate and it'll go into the future, it might go into the past. And so when you're in this state of mind where you're, you're just kind of in this, you know, futuristic or you're in the past, you're in autopilot. And so you're not able to notice opportunities when they arise. We live in a very noisy world. There are almost an infinite number of things that are trying to pull our attention away. This is one of those things, it's just that, that external noise that you can kind of filter through. My number one recommendation would be to begin a meditation practice. But when you sit and, and you practice, that the first thing that you should do is set an intention. Set an intention. When you wake up in the morning, 
generally is where when a lot of people meditate. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning, set an intention for that day. Okay, set an intention for that day, and then when you sit. And you're beginning your meditation practice. Set an intention for that practice. Basically, you're getting in the habit of of establishing this intention. And the more that you are aware of that intention, the more you can align yourself with it. And then there's the focus and the concentration. Think about how much time that you spend watching television or listening to the radio, or how much time you just spend daydreaming in any given day. The benefits of, of this practice of meditation and mindfulness can be felt in as little as 10 minutes. And those 10 minutes kind of set the path for the rest of your day, your week, your month. And arguably that's the most important time that you have to get the house in order. And so it's important just to carve that time out. It's important to be able to sit and do the meditation practice, but it's also important to be able to carry that level of focus and concentration and mindfulness throughout the day. If you're stuck in traffic, that's a great opportunity for you to practice mindfulness. Well, how does it feel to sit in the car seat? What, what, what does the steering wheel feel like? Does it have a temperature? Does it have a texture? So this is really training. You're really training yourself to stay present. Uh, just like any exercise at the gym, the more you practice and the more you train, the better you get at it. Each time you practice, it's almost as if you're planting a seed. And these seeds will take root when you need them the most. Life doesn't happen when you're sitting in a chair on a cushion and you're meditating. You know? Life happens when you're, when you're out and, and, and something happens. And then there's effort. And that is probably the, the most underrated component of being successful or happy or what have you, is that effort. You have to move towards that intention. A lot of people think that the path of success is linear which it couldn't be the farthest thing from the truth. It takes you time to build skill. Everyone wants to be rich and famous, but they don't understand the time and, and the skill and the practice and training and even the failures. You have to fail in order to become great. It's a part of the process. So it's that, that shift of my mindset rather than saying, okay, I'm just gonna stop doing this just because uh, I'm just not good at it. I'd be like, what a wonderful opportunity for me to learn to become better so I can ultimately get to where I wanna be. And so I just realized that everything is based on perception. The mind is programmed to view things as threats and as problems. But if you're present and if you know how to practice and train, you can actually shift your perspective. You can frame and reframe the situation, what might be uh, an obstacle or a threat to one person could be an, I could view it as an opportunity. This is, this is a challenge. And that's what really shapes your reality, your perspective. What we think of reality isn't really real. It's only real to us in that moment. Everything is in a constant state of change. Then why do I try to hold on to everything? Or why do I try to control things to make them the way that I want, right? I mean, we have to understand that there is this greater natural flow of things for which we don't clearly understand, but it governs everything. We're part of this greater collective universal force. And when we try to control outcomes or even our own reality, that's when we start experiencing hardship. That's when we begin suffering. Something that uh, one of my teachers said is, pain is inevitable, but the suffering is optional. I am open to any and all possibilities, and I try to have this level of open-mindedness and curiosity about everything because everything is possible. Whatever I do, I need to do it from a place of abundance. There's plenty for everyone. The opportunities are always here. If you have that type of mindset, with the right intention and effort, you know, then you have, you're, you're able to witness the, the power of intention and synchronicity because what we're looking for is already here. It's been here the whole time. We haven't been here because we're always, the mind's always constantly out somewhere looking for something better. I think of unlimited infinite possibilities. I don't view myself as a, as a finite, as a limited being. Because if I did, then I would have limited views. 
And you think about like, what is death? And you think of it, it's like the end. But the end of what? Maybe it's the end of my experience in this body. And I would say that is what death is. And it, and it dictates this fear of death, dictates everything we do. Because if you think about it, what are we always bumping up against? What are we always racing against? What's the biggest limit that we put on ourselves? Time. Time to what? We have deadlines. What is a deadline? It's the time before you die, before you're dead. And so we're living with this continuous state of fear of dying. But if you think about who we are, the ego is finite. The ego ends or dies with the physical body. But then what about the self? What about the soul? What is death? Is it the end? Or is it really the beginning? The beginning of a new level of consciousness, maybe that we're not aware of. And we're afraid of what we don't know. But if you think about what happens when we die, we're fearful of this, this suffering, right? But if you think about how did, how did we come about in this world? As babies, we come out through separation of the mother's womb, crying. So maybe that was the end. The death in this life is maybe the beginning. Maybe the purpose of this life is to, to gather wisdom through these experiences. And if you look at where do we learn and grow the most, it's not so much in our successes, but more so through our failures, through our trials and tribulations. We're collectively part of something much bigger than ourselves. And the way that I believe that we communicate is through intuition. And it's, a, it's extremely important because, it, because we're making all kinds of very important decisions every day that will determine the trajectory of our lives. And we don't know the answers. And a lot of times that intuition helps us and it guides us to exactly where we need to be. But you need to be able to be open-minded, you need to be curious, and you need to have trust. I feel like something has guided me to exactly where I am right now. And I honestly believe that, that you are exactly where you need to be in any given moment. Like the past was perfect preparation for this very moment. And this universal flow of things that we're all a part of, it is working for us. It is not working against us. And so that's why it's really important to be able to let go and be able to almost in a sense kind of surrender to that force because it, it, it is ultimately going to guide you to where you need to be even if it doesn't seem like it in that moment. And a big, a big part of my practice is equanimity, is, and that's being okay with things as they are. And that's what allows you to be in the moment. And generally, that's when you start experiencing things like flow. And that's where you, you're finding a lot of the satisfaction and the fulfillment, is when you're in that moment, in that state of flow is when you're experiencing those things. And you can only experience that now, in this moment, not at some point in the future. Happiness, for me, was a, was a destination. It was a prize. You know, I'm going to be really happy once I do all these great things, and then I'll be happy, which isn't true. And I realized that the happiness was already here, except I wasn't. I was always constantly out. I was sending my mind out into the future, planning for a for a, a better future. But everything I wanted is here in the now. And another thing that you have to think about is that a lot of people like feel guilty for, for taking care of themselves, right? It's not called being selfish, it's called uh, self-care. If you want to live in, in a peaceful, harmonious world, then you have to be peaceful. And uh, Viktor Frankl, which is an Austrian psychiatrist, he says it eloquently when he says, maybe the purpose of life is not so that we can make it to get through life, but maybe the purpose of life is so that we can help other people get through it, to help other people get through their suffering. And I really believe that, because that's what's given my life purpose. That's why I wake up in the morning. They wish to make a lot of money. In Europe, every American student if more every American adult 
is regarded as someone who is just out to make a lot of money. Really, 16%, 16% of these students regarded their main goal and concern in life to make a lot of money. I'm quoting literally, make a lot of money. You know what the top category was? 78% of these American youngsters were concerned as they expressed it themselves with finding a meaning and purpose in their lives. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor, this was not me, this was Goethe. He said this verbally. And now you will understand why I, in one of my writings, once said, this is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. So if you don't recognize a young man's will to meaning, man's search for meaning, you make him worse, you make him dull, you make him frustrated, you still add and contribute to his frustration. While if you presuppose in this man, if in this so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent or drug abuse and so forth, there must be a, a what we call spark, yeah? a spark of search for meaning. Let's recognize this. Let's presuppose it. And then you will elicit it from him and you will make him become what he in principle is capable of becoming. I'm thinking, how can I help people get through their suffering? Because we're all suffering, everyone. So when I go out and I teach and I facilitate, you know, this is a continuation of my own practice. I don't feel like, okay, I'm teaching now. This is a part of my meditation practice. Even me sitting here and speaking, I'm in a meditative state because that is one way to achieve a higher self or higher, a higher level of consciousness is to be of service to others. There's even karma yoga. You can achieve enlightenment through service to others. Because if you think about it, what is the difference between you and I? Is it the, the skin? Uh, is it the, the, the spatial distance? Is it the molecules in the air? Well, what is really the difference between you and I? And if you really go down deep enough and you really, you really do this, stick with this practice, you'll realize that there is no difference. We're all part of the same thing. We're all in this dream together. So that maybe the, the purpose is not so that I can get ahead, but maybe it's so that I can help you get through it.